You're listening to the 2020 Nelson Arts Festival Poka Poka Talks. This session, Historical Fiction, features Christine Lunens and Alexandra Tidswell in conversation with Kerry Sunderland. <laughs> Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. My name is Kerry Sunderland. Um, a number of you might have heard that a few times already. Um, I'm the coordinator of Puka Puka Talks, a literary program for the Nelson Arts Festival. And welcome here this afternoon to hear a conversation with two extraordinary women, thinkers and writers, um, Christine Lunens and Alexandra Tidswell. I'm going to introduce them in a minute, but let's just give them a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, before I do my introductions, uh, just a reminder, please, to put your phone on silent. I just got a little buzz to come downstairs and realise mine wasn't, so I'm glad that happened, so I could turn it on silent. And um, the session, we're going to have a conversation for about 15 minutes, and then I will open up to questions, and Hella will be able to grab this roving mic and bring it around. I'd really appreciate it if you could use the mic when you're asking questions because we're recording this session for a podcast. So it's wonderful we can hear the question as well. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Christine first, who's um, right on my left. Um, and I imagine most of you know who Christine is and that she is the author of Caging Skies, which was uh, adapted by Taika Waititi into the Oscar award-winning film Jojo Rabbit. Um, the, but before that, Caging Skies was an international bestseller, and I'll get Christine to tell us a little bit more about how many languages it's been translated into now around the world um, before the film was made. And, but it's a lovely boost to have a film made about your book, isn't it? And, and give it a second, a second life in the bookstores. So can I just have a little show of hands who's seen Jojo Rabbit? Okay. <laughs> and me too, of course. Um, so, that's, so that's great. So since her appearance at last year's Puka Puka Talks, which was... Almost, it was like a, the day or two after the film came out, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Christine and Taika were both nominated for a USC Libraries Scripter Award, honouring both the book and the screenplay, and both won AFI Awards for their contribution to America's cultural legacy. That was last, well, this year, wasn't it? 2020. 2020. The film was nominated for two Golden Globes, six BAFTAs and six Academy Awards and won both the BAFTA and the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, as well as Humanitas Prize for writing intended to promote human dignity, me meaning and freedom. And Christine's going to talk a little bit about Caging Skies because it is an historical fiction, um, but she's also, we hope, going to talk a little bit about her current work in progress, which is an historical novel set at the time of the Rainbow Warrior bombing. So we'll talk a little bit about that today too. Um, what you might not know, but hopefully you do, is that Christine is also the author of two other novels which have been published, Primordial Soup and A Can of Sunshine. They are both contemporary novels, so today we'll be discussing the historical fiction, but I'm sure if you want to mention something about those two books as well, when it's relevant. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that Christine is appearing here today um, in, with uh, the, her fee is going to be donated to Artio, uh, Literacy Aotearoa um, as, in recognition of the fantastic work they do. And you might want to say yeah. a few words about yes. that later. So, yes, so I just want to now. say thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone um, for coming today. And I just wanted to mention, for um, because part of the book and everyone here is very literary, and I'm always mindful of the people who actually never, for whatever story that um, befell them, weren't able to learn to read and to write. And I always want to say that there's absolutely no shame in that. There's people right here in Nelson. I've been to the Office of Literacy, Aotearoa here. Um, and that there's no shame for a young adult and an adult not knowing how to write. Whatever story got them there, um, you know it's been a very hard story, but it takes one brave step back to learning and they can make that story their own. Mm. So, so yeah, great. Yeah. 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 yeah, 
Yeah, so it's a bit wonderful. Know by coming here to s this session that you're also, in, in a way, supporting literacy after your role. Yeah. So, Tenakwe, Alexandra. Um, Alexandra is a seventh generation New Zealander who's always been interested in stories of early New Zealand and how they've shaped our culture. And her first novel, which is here on the table, um, is Lewisville. And it was published in 2016 and is based on true events. And interestingly, I think fascinatingly, is inspired by... I've got to get the number of grand, great greats <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> is inspired this, by the story of her great, great, great grandmother. Is that Something the right like number? That, yeah. Or is there one more? One more, more. One more. Yeah. great, 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 great <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> um, Mary Ann Luxford, who um, migrated to New Zealand in the 1840s um, from a Willoughby in the, in the UK. And um, it's a sort of a rags to riches story in a way. And she be provided the inspiration for Martha, who is the main character in Louisville, who will be talking a little bit more about Martha and about your grandmother. Um, and like Christine, um, Alexandra has a work in progress and, and she's going to maybe talk a little bit about it, although as many writers believe, sometimes it kind of jinxes <laughs> a work in progress when you talk about it too much, but I'm sure she'll, she'll be able to share a little bit about it um, for us. Um, uh, Alexandra is also um, working in the communications field in bicultural communications and has been a former diplomat. So you've got lots of interesting life experience and um, connecting with, with people. And your current book is a, is a story about Māori around the same time, around the same era as Louisville was set. So, um, and your work, you do a lot of work in uh, expanding our understanding of te reo and, and, and bicultural work. So it would be lovely to hear a bit more about that too. So welcome to you both. So my first question is for both of you, and maybe Alexandra, you'd like to answer it first, is why historical fiction? What has drawn you toward, towards writing history? Mm. Um, Oh, kia ora everybody, uh, ngā mihi mahana ki ngā mana whenua o te tauihu, tēnā koutou. Um, so why historical fiction? I don't think it was really a conscious choice for me. Um, I felt like I, I just had the story on my brain from when I was quite young and it really needed to be written. But in retrospect, I think I, if I'd known how much hard work it was, <laughs> I might have thought contemporary fiction sounded like a lot more fun. Um, <laughs> so I don't think I sort of willingly went, oh yeah, I can write about the past, but I am really, really interested in our, particularly Aotearoa stories of the past. I think we've got some amazing history, good and bad, um, all of it fascinating. And yeah, I think that sort of, I did actually start writing Louisville as a true story, but it just, felt like it needed the, I guess, the little bit of magic or fairy dust that comes with a novel. And I wanted it to be a book that was really hard to put down. I wanted it to have some sort of feeling of connecting with people. And I think you sort of have the bones of the story, but you do need to dress them up with the imaginative side of it as well. So historical fiction, and I do read a lot of historical fiction, um, so I guess it, it, it lent itself perfectly to that, to that genre. But, um, and I am doing another one, which is probably silly. Next time it might be contemporary, I think. <laughs> it might come out a bit quicker. Mm. So you, the story that inspired you to write Louisville, you, you've had known that story since you were about 10 years old, yes, is that right? Yeah. I had, yeah. yes. A very sad photograph of Mary Ann, who's Martha's daughter, um, looking very tragic. And I always thought, what an interesting woman, why is she so sad? And, and my grandmother had some theory about it, which was obviously it was actually completely cuckoo. But at the time, I thought it was fascinating. And then spent a long time researching it and finding out what really did happen. So it's just a little story. It's a little, I suppose, a little microcosm of lots of people's family stories um, across all cultures about immigration and what pushes people to escape um, horrible lives and try and make better ones. So, yeah, just a tiny story, really, um, that somehow managed to fill up all these pages. <laughs> <laughs> With a gripping tale. So, so, Christine, why historical fiction for you? Um, well, one of the reasons was um, when I started to write Caging Skies, so that was about uh, the year 2000 when I began it, World War II was just far enough in the past where lots of people were still alive and lots of people I could talk to, you know, people the age at the time who would be grandparents. And I managed to put a lot of things um, into paper that I felt were going to be lost. For example, uh, I had a lot of, I was working in a World War II um, library with a lot of resources, a museum library. 
And in the books you would read, they would tell you a lot of the facts, but they wouldn't tell you what day-to-day -day life was. And I wanted to actually see war, but how it was in someone's everyday life on a very small domestic scale. So there were lots of women who could tell me, you know, exactly what they would get to eat, how they would survive, where they would get their soap. And I was able to put these things you couldn't find in books. And um, the funny thing was, at the time, People of my generation knew lots of the war because, you know, there were the grandparents and because people talked about it. You couldn't have a meal without, you know, finishing your food because, you know, during the war, during the war. So you heard it every day. But I found that by the time Jojo Rabbit had come out, I was meeting a whole new generation of people who knew nothing of it, um, who didn't even actually know some of the most basic facts of the, the war. And I found that quite frightening. And the book that I'm just, it's in the editing stage now, the new one is in, takes place in New Zealand during the 80s, so it was during the Rainbow Warrior bombing, it was during the time of Carlos days and um, uh, the protests in the Pacific. And what I do find is though the 80s to me seems you know, like yesterday, and I'm sure it will to many people here, I realize it doesn't take that long to get another 20 years that comes along and people never realize what that was like because people just assume things were always done the way things are done now. And so I like just that part, for me, my area of fiction is just that part where I can still talk to people who are alive, but before it's uh, lost. So I find Alexandra very brave to go, you know, so many mm. generations back. That's a long back. way back. Yeah, that's a long yeah, way back, but yeah. very brave. One, one well. of the things that I think is also um, e exciting about writing historical fiction is it's a, a funny thing that you suddenly realise that all the people that lived in 1840 thought they were really modern and really cool and contemporary. And it's, it, that always well, jolts me. Well, they were. Me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, they were. And so we also are going yeah. to be someone's historical fiction, which yeah. is a banal thought, I know. But I do actually, every time I think it, I think, wow, it's really exciting to bring them alive and give them their voice back and make us realise that we're all part of that river. Um, of history and it's just a continuum and, to yeah. and the details, the everyday yes. details is what makes us connect with them as well. Yes, if I can say one thing about reading Alexandra's um, book, I found that often in the past you had, um, in that era you always hear with little women and things how important, you know, the fabric someone was wearing had uh, an idea woman her self-worth, you know, was it a good fabric, what kind of ribbon did she have, you know, that took such importance and sometimes at the time when um, women were actually doing something like teaching or doing a job that was looked upon because they said, oh, I'd have to tire myself teaching. And when you read that kind of historical fiction, I'm so glad and appreciative to be in this era where <laughs> someone has a job teaching and they say, actually, my sense of worth is from teaching others and you know that our sense of who we are is also from what we do and that there's not something disgraceful of having to actually do something. We see it as enriching for ourselves and for other people. So that's wonderful to look at that and to say, mm. look at the lives we have today, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess we'll get into the nitty gritty of the research you've both done and it's quite different because like you say, you had primary research. Um, you could interview people and find out things. Whereas you were very much relying on secondary research, book research and record documents and so on. Um, but maybe also channeling some things from your great, 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 Grandmother, <laughs> um, but it's interesting, isn't it? What what the definition of historical fiction is? Because I remember when we first met, and I asked you, and you said, "Um, you're working on historical fiction," and you mentioned um, it was set in the time of the, in the eighties, and I went, "Wow, is that is is the eighties now historical <laughs> fiction?" Um, but there is there's there's apparently an official definition of it as from the Historical Novel Society, which is um, genres of work that are written at least 50 years after the events described, but others say it can be much more recent, although typically it's at least 25 years. So you mentioned a few, yeah. you mentioned 30 years, 20 yeah. years. And, yeah. and the reason is because I find that the world's changed so much. When I look at the 80s, even everything, uh, uh, communication was completely different how people would um, communicate. You know, people were struggling to get coins, you know, to have the right coin to put in, the coin would get stuck. And that whole world, I think there's the world since everything's been um, more IT-centric. 
to, to how the world was in the 80s. It does feel long ago, though I was there. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, oh, well, particularly with technology, it's really evident when we're watching something now and, and we see the old-fashioned mobile phones. It's, it feels yes, you couldn't yeah. have Romeo and Juliet as a novel today because, of course, they would just send a text and say, hey, Romeo, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. <that laughs> All's good, your dad's happy. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. All sorts. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm curious, um, which you mentioned in your introduction, Alexandra, that you love reading historical fiction. So I'm curious, which historical fiction writers are your favourite? Maybe just mention one or, one or two other writers. Um, like well, interest? interestingly, I had just finished Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall when I started writing Lewisville, and I had actually, I think I'd sort of overlapped a little bit, and I'd started writing, as I mentioned, it wasn't a novel, and then I started novelising it, and it was in the past tense. And I suddenly had this epiphany when I was reading Wolf Hall that part of the reason, well obviously she's an amazing writer, but she has the sense of immediacy in the book because she writes it in the present tense. And so I shamelessly stole that idea and went through and changed the tense. And it, I think she has this incredibly clever way of making her people feel very contemporary, partly through dialogue, which is something I've really studied um, with her and other historical fiction writers, how you make it authentic but not really boring, mm -hmm. and that way of making it slightly contemporary so that it's almost just on the edge of what they probably would have said, but it's enough to keep a modern reader interested. Um, but apart from her, the other two that I kind of in my little Bibles, one of them is Penelope Fitzgerald's The Blue Flower, which is a kind of a little novella, um, and it's about a German romantic poet called Novalis. And it's so spare, there's something so clever, like obviously she's done, it's like the tiny, tiny tip of an iceberg and there's all this amazing research. But it's a very, very short novel and very elliptical, so there's lots of bits missing that make you have to really use your imagination and work hard. So she uses all her historical detail as this wonderful like breadcrumb trail through the book. And it's just such a beautiful book, it's really, really well written. It's a, a slightly dodgy subject matter because he fell in love with a 14-year-old, which Ooh. I think was probably okay in those days. I, I don't know, because they all got married really young. But um, it's quite, it's an amazing story. It's really mm. well written. And the other one um, is Jenny Erpenbeck. I'm not sure if any of you guys oh, have read yeah. much of hers, but there's a book she wrote called A Visitation, which is about a house in <coughs> Germany. And it just follows the house. But again, she has that same really amazing style where... You know, she's done all this work, and yet she's narrowed it. It's almost like poetry, because this, every single word does the work of 100 words. Um, and so that's a style of historical fiction that really I'm aiming for. I feel like I'm at kindergarten, but I'm going for that. That's where I hope to be when I'm 80. Um, but so that's the kind of historical fiction that I like. I, I don't like so much the really, really rich, very descriptive a lot of research packed into the book story. I like the ones where I can, they give me a little hint, but I can do uh, the work And am I right? Oh, no, Wolf Hall was a series, it was part of a series, it wasn't was, it? Yeah, yeah. So they're not just one-offs. the bodies and, yeah. That, that was amazing because it's such a huge piece of work. Okay, so for me it would be, um, I've just finished reading Roots from Alex Huxley and I found that incredibly moving. Now, it's very thick. There is a lot of research because it went through the different generations and there are parts when you come across and you feel he's going, you know, he's leading the plot into this historical fact and leading it again and leading it again to really pack a lot of history in there. Um, but that one I, I didn't mind because he managed to do it in a way that felt genuine all the same. Um, and I felt that was a very, um, very important novel. I'm about to read because there was a little question of plagiarism I hadn't known about in some of the parts to there. So I want to read the author from the works, he was an anthropologist and there was a little bit of his work that appeared in there, so I mm. want to discover this author. Um, the other one I read, because I began to read a lot of um, historical fiction that had become a movie, so of course I looked back to Gone with the Winds to see how a big book like that could have gone you know, into a, uh, a movie, so that was Margaret Mitchell's novel. And also to ask myself the question, because there's a thorny question now, um, Lots of people say there are elements of this novel. Should we just stop reading this novel? Um, because there are, uh, yeah, there are stereotypes and there are some problems. The, the, it, it, for me, when I read it, I did feel that there were um, moments where the author is clearly saying that the only one who has a moral compass, Ashley, was the one who would abolish slavery tomorrow. And I think through him, she was trying to get the voice. But sometimes when it's the assumed narrator, you have comments that are offensive um, to how people look. And I wish they would just 
remove those because I'm sure if the author were living today, they'd want themselves to remove it. I sometimes don't want them to throw everything away um, because society thankfully changes. Um, if I say something in 200 years from now, please, by all means, <laughs> just <laughs> remove it, but don't throw the whole book out. Um, <laughs> because people do live in their era, and some, although uh, writers are usually a little bit more sensitive, they're not 200 years or 300 or 500 years down the line sensitive. So don't get rid of everything, but get rid of what offends mm. and do them a favor because just that's probably what they would have done had they been lucky enough to have reached that stage yeah. themselves. I think that's fascinating and I'd like to come back to that in a minute, that kind of idea about how we, as writers, you deal with the, um, the different social mores and, and, and cult culturally accepted things that we do yeah. at the time and be, and be faithful to them while at the same time not being offensive in, in the modern day. But before we do that, I just want to ask you, because you both are, are, have quite good academic credentials. Um, Alexandra has a, a, a LLB, a bachelor, you know, that's a Bachelor of Law, isn't it? Yes. And a BA in Māori from Otago University. And Christine has a Master of Liberal Arts in English and American Literature and Language from Harvard University and a PhD in, from uh, Victoria U University of Wellington. Um, so how important was, is it for a write, someone who's setting out to write historical fiction to learn how to do research, which both of you would have done in, in those postgraduate. It's important, but I don't think it's absolutely vital. I, I think some people could learn how to do it, uh, through, but through the help of a librarian, who, uh, because I've read books of people who didn't have quite that background, but the librarians were very, very helpful, and they managed you know, to answer the questions. Um, Internet today would make it easier, and we didn't have internet, so it was funny because someone made a comment one time on something um, of the book, and they said, oh, they might have found this by doing a Google search, and I felt like saying there was no Google when I did this. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, the long way where you call people, you waited for them to call back, you left messages on their answering machine, but I think some things people could find. However, there is a, a downside to that. Um, in the new book I did, sometimes I saw that even known facts were, would have on official websites different information on two different official websites and they would get it wrong. So what happens online now is once the wrong information is out there, lots of people copy it and then something's wrong but it just goes all over the place. So I think it is more helpful to, to be able to check the primary source. It is now to sift what's really fact from which is just an error that's been uh, taken on. So yeah, it, it probably was helpful for the patient's aspect and to, to know different ways you, know, uh, you could find out. But um, Simon Wiesenthal in uh, Vienna was very helpful because there were some questions I didn't know uh, for the Jewish people at the time, how people would find them, how w they would go about it, and he was still alive. So I asked a lot of questions, and then at some st stage I did what I always call the treasure hunt. It's just these tiny little details you don't know but that I need to check. Mm -hmm. So I start by asking all my friends who are a certain age, you know, um, uh, or I have someone check things, and someone said in the new one, um, the new novel I was writing, they said, no, tapas in New Zealand in the 80s, no one knew what tapas were. <laughs> so I had to change the scene around and take that into what question. What did they eat? So they said, no, so the person wouldn't have known. So they said, we didn't know this. And, you know, yeah. cr cr so yeah. that was very, very helpful to... Uh, so you mean tapas as in Spanish? Yeah, Spanish food. They there said there were no tapas yeah, in New yeah. Zealand in the 1980s. So what did, you make, what did you make the meat instead? No, so what I had is I had the person who had traveled oh, refer okay. to tapas, and then the okay. other one pretend he knew what they were talking okay. about. <laughs> That's very convenient. And yeah, so that was very... <laughs> So yeah. I had to work that in. So. Ale Alexandra, what do you think about, mm. you know, actually is how learning important. how to yeah. do research I think if you have skill. curiosity, you mm. can find your way. And I yeah. think it's also that thing of having a really open mind because um, it, it's for me particularly looking at a lot of stuff that was written, a huge amount of things that were written were written through a particularly colonising gaze. Um, so obviously I, a lot of things have to be taken with a big grain of salt and a lot of work has to be done to step off that sort of very beaten path of the stuff that we all know exists and look for other perspectives. Um, but also, one thing that I find really interesting is how unreliable everything is. 
because um, you know you, you start I do a lot of memoir reading so I found all sorts of the internet is just such an amazing place I found all sorts of memoirs that 80 or 90 year olds had written there was a big vogue I think in about the 1910s and 1920s for a lot of old people I think they were all asked to write down their memories and because they were the original for European settlers they were the original pioneers and a lot of Maori as well were invited to do this as part of a sort of a project I suppose to encapsulate what happened during the New Zealand wars um, and some of them are re they're all fascinating but a lot of them actually contain quite a lot of errors of fact so it's quite it can be quite muddling um, so you'll read somebody and obviously a lot of them are writing about something that happened 70 years or some 60 or 70 years earlier but they'll often have dates wrong or places or um, their memory of some event will be a little bit mixed up with another event that happened um, all of which is you know, even more muddling for the writer who's trying to make sure that they don't get that phone call from that pedantic person who read the book and said, that did not happen that way, which is inevitable when you're writing historical fiction. But um, I tend to sort of like to grab it all. Unfortunately, it's a weakness for me. It becomes a problem because I will keep on keeping on and going down more rabbit holes and more rabbit holes and it starts to become really overwhelming and then I realise that I haven't ri written enough, I've just been reading too much. And another problem that, I don't know if you have this, Christine, but I sometimes feel like research is almost the antithesis to imagination as well. So sometimes that to be a really good creative writer, you need to ask, what if, what if this happened, or what if that happened? And in the back of your mind, it's like screaming, no, but this is what happened, because you did all that research, remember? So, and there's a kind of a tussle between the imaginative what if and the reality of what is. So that's an issue for me. I sometimes kind of find myself a little bit um, like an anchor. The research can be an anchor on where I would really like to go with my writing. Um, and also just it's incredibly time consuming as well. So the more pedantic and um, obsessive you get about being a good researcher, I think it in some ways it can be a handicap. It's good yeah. procrastination in a way. It's, it becomes <laughs> a type of procrastination. Yeah. And, you, and you're always thinking that under the next little stone you're going to find this gem. Yeah. You know, it'll be the answer. Yeah. yeah. What, what I did when, uh, with the books is to be very careful because you sketch what the historical events were at the time, but then you, it's actually the imagination and the plot because these have to be real people, you know, real characters mm. who actually mm. have their own story and their story, although it has a historical connection, their story has to be outside the history. It has to be just about them. So as they're living their life and whatever they've enmeshed themselves in and the difficulty they've got themselves in, there is this background of history which sometimes will come in and come out. But what I try to tell myself is, I'm not the historian, so for example, when it works into the plot, I bring it in, but I don't have to give every interesting thing that ever happened mm. you know, during that time, otherwise it, it does weigh you down and you can't keep moving forward. So it is mm. a kind of the weaving balancing. where you say, okay, I'll take this, but now this would feel forced if I put this in, so no one's going to come, you know, if they want to know more about the era. I did have that trouble with the new novel in that I was so fascinated with the, um, with the bombing and the French agents and things, you know, when they came in, that there was initially in the early draft, I would get off topic and then I would go two pages, you know, because I couldn't resist, but then when I read through it, even I felt, oh, now we're slowing down because you have what's happening to the characters and you know that's exciting and suddenly here comes the history lesson so with a lot <laughs> of pain i had to you know just copy highlight delete and like mm. but uh, then i thought okay if someone wants to read that they'll read uh, michael king i put in the back acknowledgments and they can write r michael king's work which is fabulous and that will give all those details about that so yeah so i guess that leads very nicely into my next question which is um and maybe I'll ask two questions at once because they seem to be going. So um, I'm interested in how you research informs the development of your characters and how research informs um, one or two of the key plot points. So I guess, um, and then I, I guess an umbrella question for both of those is, can you be more imaginative with the characters than you can with the plot points because they have to be more faithful to historical events that happened? You can't make up an event that, you know, a big event. I mean, obviously, private events can be in invented, but yeah. So, would would you like to comment? I think a you can um, yeah. be more creative with your characters because they are your your own little creations, essentially. Although, again, I did step a very fine line writing about real people, and I did have a a big kind of 
crisis of conscience of whether I should change the names of everyone in this book because they're not just my ancestors, there are a lot of other people are related, as I've found out, because I've had many, many people who are descended from the Luxfords contact me, and even people in Australia and in the UK who have read the book have contacted me who were like the great, 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 great grandchild of the heroine's husband's brothers, you know, I mean, really quite distant. Um, <laughs> just amazing stuff. It's like there's an amazing sort of web out there of ancestry.com type people, and it's fantastic. It's, it's been very helpful, actually, in selling the book. But, um, yeah, with the characters, I feel like there's a, an example of one of the characters in here is um, Harriet, who is the, one of the daughters, and it's a bit of a spoiler, but she's left in the workhouse. Um, and she's a really sad character, and I did a lot of research about her before I read about uh, before I wrote about her. But I I found all these workhouse um, records that talked about this poor girl, and she had a I think it was sort of housemaid's knee or something. She had a scrofular knee, I think it was described as, which was tuberculosis in the knee, which who knew? But she was she limped. She had to have special boots ordered by the workhouse, so she kept popping up in the records. This poor little girl, Harriet Grimm, and. She was such a tragic figure that it really informed how I then developed her because I almost had her sort of sadness hanging around me from reading these, looking at these transcripts and going, wow, this poor child, she had a terrible time and she went there at eight or something um, until she was eventually rescued by um, an apprenticeship somewhere. But So yeah, her character then developed in this way that she was sort of a little sparrow of a child. She was quite kind of quiet and shy and, and she was handicapped and she had these, and her mother had abandoned her. So I could really lean into that, you know, what I had of her and then fill her out as a human being. But then she started really taking on her own life and she was really quite a tough little nut and she ends up in a, you know, good place in the novel. So it was kind of, I think there's that thing of starting with a little um, bio from, you know, the casting thing, of all the things I know about her and then put a little match to it and poof, it goes in its own way, it builds up. And it's an exciting process because you do almost have to get out of the way, don't you find sometimes with the characters? Yeah, well, the characters, when I, I found something very humbling as a writer, is that um, when I first was writing, I thought, I'm the writer, I can make the character do whatever I want them to do. I mean, they're my character. And then writing is actually, it's two parts. You write during one day, and then the next day you look you know, at what you wrote. And there's the parts you keep, and then there's the parts you think, oh goodness, burn this before anyone ever sees it. But one thing that's very surprising is there's some things you do, even if you're the one who wrote it, when you read it, you don't believe it. You say, my character wouldn't have done that, because it's almost like the DNA of a character, and they have a personality, and they do take on a life of their own. And you can't just make them do anything, and then it's believable. Once their personality is there, and they've come to life, they have as much a kind of as you would say of your own sister, my sister would never do that, my husband would never know that, because you know that, well, the character has that kind of uh, tenacity to them, um, too. So within the historical framework, they have who they are, they come, you know, as a child, and they have something that just keeps their personality uh, throughout. So um, that's not, the research just informs some things, for example, um, I had one researcher from um, the UK who's doing a thesis now on caging skies. And she contacted me, and one of her questions, she told me, um, you know, that's very cruel. So in the book, th the boy kills uh, uh, ducklings, and in the film, he kills rabbits. And she said to me, she's young, um, that's so, such a terribly cruel thing. And I had to remind her, I said, this was the 1940s. Um, people lived on farms, they killed animals all the time. When you ate, you had to kill the chicken yourself. I said it wasn't the era. There were no supermarkets where you went to the supermarket and you had that. And everyone was in the Boy Scouts then or some kind of club and just uh, skinning an animal and wringing the neck, you know, that was just part of it. In fact, in Vienna uh, and Austria in particular, even today hunting is still important and most young men would have done it. So I said, we've become, you know, those, uh, she's vegan and everything. And I said, you know, <laughs> this, <laughs> I know how terribly <laughs> cruel that would sound, but I said, this is a completely different era and you have to look at it through the lens of that era. Mm. So people are part of the era. You can't have somebody, you know, it would be just plain bizarre to have someone in the 1940s who would faint, you know, by, by oh, yeah, having a chicken yeah. because that's just not yeah. uh, true to its era. 
This yeah. And that's a real issue, I think, with um, writing about early New Zealand. There's such a temptation to make, and I notice this in lots of historical fiction, there's a temptation to make every girl character really feminist and spunky and, like, always kind of super ahead of her time somehow, but it's also, it's, it's, it sort of has to be resisted a little bit as well, because it's not true oh, to the era. Oh, listen, one thing I have a problem with, I won't name any novels, but there are some kind of uh, novels that are going around the Holocaust, and they're what I call feel-good novels. So they're in the concentration camp, and everyone is just thinking of giving their food away <laughs> and <spe> showing <laughs> nothing but warmth and kindness. And really, it breaks my heart because these people aren't bad people for being hungry and acting like human beings act when they're really hungry. And it's important that we see the truth of this and what the truth is in these dark times and what people did. It doesn't make them less human or less kind or anything. It just shows the terrible things some people did to others and then how people, what they had to do to survive. Because th there were people who were very generous and might have given their food away, but they weren't the ones who were there to survive, often to tell you know, how things mm. were. Mm. Um, and because I had spoken to people who are real survivors, I have, uh, you know, and read Primo Levi and things, it was a very, very tough world. And it, I don't want to see that suddenly become some kind of um, Bambi cartoon that shows just, mm. you know, all kindness and helpness. It, it wasn't the Girl Scouts, mm. that, those places. It was really very horrific and people did horrific things. But they were in states of desperation when people are trying to save their lives. Sometimes they do anything just to, to have a crust of bread. So someone who's never known what it's like to miss a single meal of their life, you know, who's always had, you know, let's say in their dormitory or their hall of residence, you know, three warm meals a day, they don't know what it's like having to do hard labor and not have had enough food, you know, for months or years. So that kind of fiction, sometimes I do cringe because I don't like uh, modern sensitivity put there and imposed on characters, you know, that were, th that just what didn't exist at that time. It has to be true, otherwise to me it resonates as something that doesn't feel genuine to me. Yeah. That's um, an in a fascinating point, and one thing that people who haven't read Caging Skies might not know is that Johannes grows up in the book, where he doesn't in the film. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we sort of reach a certain ending in, in the film. And some of the choices he makes um, when he's a little bit older, and Elsa's still there in the house with him, are questionable through our modern lens, aren't they? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about some, you know, when those decisions that he makes... When okay. he's a bit older in the so um, the the film Tyke and I had agreed early on he couldn't I mean if it were to be a feature film it had to stop at some point um, and I saw this too with Gone with the Wind because even though it's three hours there's actually a lot of things that are left off so most people don't know that Scarlett O'Hara actually she had um, three children before she was with uh, uh, Red Butler and uh, that Melanie, the very sweet girl, was actually uh, sewing things for the Ku Klux Klan <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so there's a lot of surprising, but it's broader. And this one goes on to the occupation. So what happens is after the war is lost, uh, that's when Johannes Day tells his lie, and the lie lasts for a few years in the book, whereas in the film he tells the lie, and then they're losing the war, and right away that's where it ends. Um, and so this goes into the occupation. So there were four zones in Vienna. You had uh, the French were occupying, the Brits were occupying, the Americans and the Russian, which in itself was historically very interesting to think of Vienna cut in, you know, to four pieces like a cake. And each area they had was completely different what happens in the American sector from what happened to the Russian. So I thought it was interesting to navigate through that. And then it becomes, um, I don't want to give too much uh, a spoiler for those who haven't read, but it just becomes uh, a work of where the imagination starts and where um, reality comes in, how the world could have taken a different turn, how sometimes when something you wish comes true, you try to recreate that, that atmosphere. And then it's very ambiguous how much Elsa actually does know. Um, she's, not the, she's not the gullible victim. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in there, so, but she has reasons for her own, um, for staying there, and part of which is survivor guilt, which was a very real thing, feeling that she never would have done what um, Johannes's parents done, risked her life. And because of that, she feels that she's somehow guilty and she owes herself a prison sentence because she's a selfish person, 
when in fact she's not the one who created this world, you know, and she had no reason to feel the survivor guilt. Yeah. But she does, and many people did yeah. at the time. Yeah. True to the times. And so, Alexandra, Martha likewise makes some decisions back in the 1800s that we these days would go, oh my goodness. So, um, and, and for some readers, I, I believe you've had some feedback that it makes her a little a bit monster. unlikable. <laughs> is the word I was going to. Yeah, but, but it's true to, true to the times and it's a survival thing, isn't it? Do you want to talk a little bit, without spoilers, about <laughs> as much as you like, about that? Um, you know, writing yeah. a true a character true true mm. in the period. Well, that she's actually a more of a monster in the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> My editor said to me, "Do you realise that every time Martha is mentioned, she's either stabbing her, she's got a needle and she's stabbing into her her sewing, or she's frowning at someone, or she's you know she was I obviously I think I had some issues about her because she had she sort of started this whole process that ended up with this sad story that had come down the family and this poor sad daughter and the one left in the workhouse and so on. So I think. Um, it was hard for me to understand, and I had young children at the time I started writing the book. Um, I just couldn't understand why she did what she did. But um, And we did go through, and I did one of those search and replace and picked up her name everywhere and realised that I had to soften her a little bit because it is quite hard to really love a book where the main character is, is a little bit unlikable. But in order to have enough guts to kind of do what she did and get out here to New Zealand, she needed to be a certain type of character. So it was a, it's a balancing act, isn't it, of having her... For that era, particularly, um, I mean, she was literally scrabbling in the dirt, you know, trying to find some old turnips or potatoes so she could feed her kids. Um, she had to have quite a lot of grit to get where she did, and, and people with lots of grit sometimes they are a bit rough on the edges. And and she did, she lied, she she does all sorts of bad things. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I had to work with what I had, and this is another thing I think with that business of research and having having historical figures that are real and timelines they have to be fitted into. It, it's it's challenging in a sense to have to always mould your story. It's it's a blessing in one way because you've got a story mapped out and you know what what's the general kind of roadmap. But um, it's also really difficult sometimes to massage both the likability factor. And just even the timeline, making the timeline work and making it all fit in with what actually happened with the colonisation of New Zealand, it's, it's a big job, isn't it? Like, it's a real juggling act, and it does make, you know, writing about, like, I think fantasy writers, I always think, why well, they can just make everything up, it must be incredible. <laughs> and, you know, if you get a really good, if you've got this world that you've created that's really fun and you've made it all up, I suppose you do have to then start remembering all your own stories, but... Just having that freedom to be able to play around like that must be incredible. Mm. Um, it does take a lot longer to write a historical novel than a contemporary novel, that's true. Yeah. Mm. It it takes having done both, you know that. Yes, I do. Oh, yes. The other one, each time when I did the new historical one, I thought, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again. it's a punishment. Because it does, it's it does take a, it's a lot more work. You have and to every take time you write account. something, you get pulled out of the creative process because you think, oh, I have to Google that and check. What kind of toothbrush would she have had? Or, you know, did they say, was that even a word? Had that word been invented in 1840? Oh, no, it didn't get invented until 1870. I'll have to find another word. So it's a constant yes. pull, isn't it? Oh that yes. check, check, checking all the time. What kind of coin? Yeah, I remember yeah. I contacted an um, elderly woman and I asked her what kind of coin it was, you know, at the time. And then because she was elderly, she started to talk to me about the Kroon when it was still the empire. And I'm like, no, 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 that, not that far back. Yeah. <laughs> and then she was going in. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I had a scene in um, at the beginning when they were in England and pineapples were a really big thing when they came in. Everybody was very excited about pineapples. And there's a scene where she's walking through the streets of London when she first gets there and someone's calling out pineapples, pineapples. And I... Luckily, I, uh, I didn't end up changing it, but I checked and found that pineapples actually arrived on England's shores kind of six months after the scene. But I thought, look, seriously, and I'm saying this to you all now, <laughs> I don't care. I just don't care. Yeah. If you have a problem with the pineapple arrival, it's too bad. Six months yeah. in... Um, <laughs> But it's 250 years ago, though, I think. I mean, 150 details. years ago. There's so, so okay. many of them that, yeah, it, it could really make you a bit nutty. Would you like to do a reading now? Let, we're going to oh. hear a little bit from both books. Sure. So, Alexander, okay. like sure. Go um, so, I'm going to read a very brief bit, um, which is about Ebenezer, who's Martha's ne'er do well husband, first husband. Um, and the chapter's called 21 Chickens in a Bag to Put Them In. On the night of the 22nd of February, 1833, there's no moon. It's a cold, pitch-black night. On the outskirts of Daventry, only five miles as the crow flies from Willoughby, Ebenezer Grimm and Davy Ward make the last preparations for their raid on William Pettifer's poultry farm. 
They've been feeding chickens to order from all over the country in the past year, and Pettifer's farm makes a convenient target. Tonight, they'll steal as many as they can carry. They've an order for 20 fresh-killed fowls, cash on delivery. Ebenezer's explained to Davy that although Pettifer is his cousin, he's the one who snitched on him the last time he escaped. He makes a fitting target. Not only does he have plenty of fine, healthy chickens, it's an excellent way to pay him back for his treachery. The two men crouch at the edge of the stone boundary wall. Get some of this on your lily white mug. Eb lobs a hunk of dirt to Davy, who smears it on his cheeks. And don't forget them big ears, glowing in the dark like two bleeding stars. Davy jams his woolen hat down hard and flashes a gappy grin. Shall we? Eb draws. He's still surprised by how much he enjoys creeping around in the dark. If the army had been more like this, he wouldn't have had to take off. Davy chuckles. After you, Captain. They scuttle across the stony field. Twice Davy stumbles, limbs flailing, but they're too anxious to guffaw at its witlessness. When they reach the outskirts of one of the barns, Ebenezer slips a pair of wire cutters out of his greatcoat pocket. His fingers are so cold he can't cut at first, but they warm to the task, and soon there's a child-sized hole in the enclosure near the barn door. They've been here several times before and know the drill like clockwork. They cut a hole, Pettifer wires it back up the next day, no doubt cursing them to hell and back. Eb and Davy double up and squeeze through the hole. The chickens are silent, apart from the odd broody cluck muffled by the barn walls. Standing by the door, Davy feels for the large padlock. In the total darkness, he takes another tool from his pocket. Although it's the best lock money can buy, for Davy, it's ten seconds' work. The door swings open and Eb grins. The blood is pounding in his head, but he feels calm. This is it, the big time. They slip into the barn, feeling their way. Once the door's shut behind them, the darkness is suffocating. The hens shuffle, sensing danger. Ebenezer strikes a flint. The flare illuminates them both. He lights his candle. Pass the bag and get to work. Davy's sly grin fades. Bag? I ain't got no bag. Their whispers are waking the chickens and the clucking grows louder. I thought you was bringing it. The two men gaze at each other for a moment. Right pair of masterminds, Ebenezer says, shaking his head. Davy's an expert lockpick, but not much good for anything else. Well, let's find Summit to put the squawkers in. He swings the candle around until he spots a large sack branded Pet of His Poultry Farm, plump with corn gleanings for the chickens. The good Lord helps him who helps himself, he says, dripping wax on the floor and setting the candle in it. Over here, Davy. Eb dumps the gleanings on the floor and stands with the bag open while Davy sweeps up the chickens one by one, cracks their necks, pauses until they stop flapping, and stuffs them in. The bag is bulging by the time the 20th bird goes in. The other chickens are clucking loudly. Before he puts out the candle, Eb grabs one last live chicken and shoves it under his arm. They pick up the sack, one on either side, and shuffle to the door in the pitch black. The chicken under Eb's arm flaps and squawks. Ring its bleeding neck, for God's sakes, Eb. Wouldn't be much of a layer for the girls then, would it? Eb shoves the chicken roughly into the sack, live, and bunches up the top. Outside, they shuffle to the hole in the fence and crawl through one at a time, manhandling the bag between them. It's hard to say what triggers the unfortunate chain of events, the commotion in the barn or the demented squawking of the chicken stuck in a bag with 20 dead kin. It may be that William Pettifer has been up every night since their last raid, waiting with his shotgun for this very moment. Whatever the case, on hearing the first shot, Davy Ward drops the heavy bag in the middle of the field and scarpers like a rabbit. Ebenezer is caught just short of the stone wall, dragging the bag of chickens. William Pettifer takes great satisfaction in kicking his front teeth in before the constabulary arrive to take him to jail. He hisses into Eb's ear, slamming a boot into his ribs for good measure. If it weren't for our granny Pettifer, I'd have shot you to ribbons. Later that night, Eb paces in his tiny cell like a trapped animal, despite the ribs cracked into what feels like shards of glass by Pettifer's cruel boot. He pauses and stares at the dark wall, tears pricking. There goes everything, just like that, all his plans up in smoke and all for some stupid, squawking chickens. He shakes his head at the foolishness of it. He doesn't care about money or a fancy house named after him. All he wants is to be with Martha and the girls. He could live like a king, right there in that little shack with the falling down chicken coop and dirty windows, as long as they were with him. At the Northampton Shire Assizes at Lent, Ebenezer Grimm pleads guilty to the theft of 21 chickens and a bag to put them in. He is sentenced to transportation to Van Diemen's Land for seven years. Martha does not come to the jail to say goodbye. Mm, thank you. And that was a pivotal moment in their, both their lives, moment. wasn't it? Because yeah. it, it, it set her off on a different Yeah, and that was one course. of the first bits of research that I did was to find that document. And I thought, 
a bag to put them in. What is going on with this man? He didn't even take his own bag to the robbery. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, that gave me a little bit of a clue into what was going on in Ebenezer's head most of the time, which I think wasn't much. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Ebenezer, was his name Ebenezer really? Yes, yeah, yeah okay. it really was. He yeah. was named after so the So you've been asked this before by Anne, who wrote a lovely article for the Nelson Mail about, about your story. Um, what percentage do you think is roughly, if you could say which percentage is imagination and which percentage is fact in, in this book? I know you're thinking. I would say sort of 75% true and the rest made up and the reason the rest was made up is because there's a big gap with Will one of the children so that whole um, experience that he has in Australia is all made up it's all imagination and the, the ending that the resolution and so on um, but that was only because I didn't have it I literally his file just went cold after the workhouse so he it was the most fun part of the book for me was because I could do what I wanted with him but all the rest is really true, and right down to uh, there's one character that's a sort of um, he's been put in there to keep the plot nicely oiled. But all of the other characters are real people; they have their real names. Right down to George Dupper, um, who was the one who was the young lordly fellow who brought them all out to New Zealand. Um, so yeah, they're all real people. So uh, hence a need to be super careful with how they're portrayed, and also make sure that I used as much fact as. Because all those descendants are out there. They yeah. are. <laughs> they are. And they read books. They read books. Okay, Christine, would you um, like to do uh, a yeah. reading now too, please? Okay, so this is um, early on in the novel, so page well, page twenty two on this edition. And it's when um, things started to change in school when Hitler has come to power. So things have changed in Austria. Um, which is now actually part of Germany. Okay. My father was wrong. That man did concern little boys like me. He, the Führer, Adolf Hitler, had a great mission to confide in us children. Only we, children that we were, could save the future of our race. We were unaware that our race was the rarest and the purest. Not only were we clever, fair, blonde, blue-eyed, tall and slender, but even our heads showed a trait superior to all other races, we were doliococephalic, where they were brachycephalic, meaning the form of our heads was elegantly oval and theirs was primitively round. I couldn't wait to get home to show my mother how she'd be proud of me. My head was something I'd never cared about before, at least not its form, and to think I had such a rare treasure sitting upon my shoulders. We learned new frightening facts. Life was a constant warfare, a struggle of each race against the other for territory, food, and supremacy. Our race, the purest, didn't have enough land. Many of our race were living in exile. Other races were having more children than we were and were mixing in with our race to weaken us. We were in great danger, but the Führer had trust in us, the children. We were his future. How surprised I was to think that the Führer I saw at Hedonplast, cheered by masses, the giant on billboards all over Vienna, who even spoke on the wireless, needed someone little like me. Before then, I'd never felt indispensable. Rather, I felt like a child, something akin to an inferior form of an adult, a defect only time and patience could heal. We were made to look at a chart of the evolutionary scale of the higher species, whereby the monkeys, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas were crouching at the lowest level. Man, to the contrary, was standing tall at the top. When Fraulein Ram began to lecture to us, I realized that some of what I'd taken to be primates were actually human races drawn in such a way that certain traits were accentuated so we would comprehend their relationship with the simians. She taught us a negroid woman, for example, was closer to the ape than to mankind. Removing the hairs of the ape had proven to scientists to what extent. She told us it was our duty to rid ourselves of the dangerous races halfway between man and monkey. Besides being sexually overactive and brutal, they didn't share the higher sentiments of love or courtship. They were inferior parasites that would weaken us and bring our race down. Matthias Hammer, known for asking oddball questions, asked her if we gave other races time, wouldn't they eventually move up the evolutionary scale on their own like we had? I was afraid Matthias was going to be scolded, but Fraulein Ram said his question was essential. After sketching a mountain on the chalkboard, she asked, if it takes one race this much time to evolve from here to there, and another race three times as long, which race is superior? We all agreed it was the first. By the time the inferior races catch up to where we are today, the peak, she said, we won't be there anymore, we'll be way up here. But she drew too quickly without looking, and the peak, she added, was too high and steep to be stable. 
Mm. And very sadly, that's probably 100% true, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, everything. Yeah. That was all the, that was part of the curriculum. They were actually teaching people. And I didn't want to um, remove very offensive things like that. I wanted him to learn that. And then he become, and then he learns th the parts after on the Jewish people are horrific. And then he comes actually, uh, you know, face to face with someone in his house who's Jewish. And at first, he, he'll think that this, she's just an exception. In fact, because w what children are taught remains so much in their mind, it takes a long time to actually uh, ever erase it. Mm. And he describes it later like rings of a tree. It's what you learned and you believed at the time. You can never erase that part of you. You can just add another ring and then add another ring. And this new part of you is just very different, but that part was still there and was still formed. And initially, he even feels guilt you know, when he starts becoming humane and human. Um, it's not something you can just take off like that. And um, mm. so I know there's parts of the book like that that um, aren't particularly pleasant, but sometimes it's important to read things that aren't all feel good mm. because it's, it makes you think and it changes you. And I went through that with Roots. I found it very upsetting um, sometimes, but uh, it was important to read to understand uh, a lot of things. Yeah, and as you, um, I think, pointed out last year in our conversation too, to understand that that's how that misinformation and, um, you know, is implanted, how, pe how people are brainwashed yes. because it's happening again. Yes, know, it's, in, it's, you know, uh, these days, yeah. I never thought that when I was doing the research for the novel that this, I wrote it so people would forget, but I never thought there would be going back to that time. And when I start to hear the most uh, basic, uh, horrific things that in the seeing the world going better and better that way and to see it start to go backwards again that's quite frightening mm. it is because it shows that things like that um, in times where people are suddenly hungry and strained and frightened things can change more quickly than people would uh, imagine because that's just a part of the worst side of human nature when people are afraid yeah yeah it's been such a, it's just gone so fast, sorry. Fascinating conversation, but we do have time for a, a couple of questions. Um, do we have any questions in, from the audience? It's because you said it's going to be a podcast now, everyone's afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there's one there. Yeah. Yep, thanks, Hella. <laughs> Hard to see. Um. So I think you both talked a little bit about um, kind of the research side and getting how you can get pulled away from your creativity, getting bogged down in those details and things. And um, I suppose just wondering what do you do to get out of that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you've fallen down that trap and you're you've gone so long that you're you've been pulled away, do you have any like tips or tricks or techniques to get back to what yeah the creative thing that you want to write? Okay, so I would say it's the two part of the two-part process of writing. So there's the part where you're actually doing the writing, for example, on a given day. Then there's the time you read it the next day. But then also when you do, let's say, your first draft, and you go back and you look at it, usually you have to rest a little bit before you go do it, and then look at it with fresh eyes. And when there's the part actually where you feel you're turning the pages, that's good. But when you yourself are saying, okay, now I'm pushing myself through this, well, you're just like any reader. So it's, you have to have a kind of amnesia, forget what you've written and then read it like it's just anything else. And when it starts to get too historical, that part's got to go. Now, had I been clever sometimes, I probably would have already known that, you know, because it's tempting. Sometimes you have this wonderful piece of history and you try to put it in and then you realize it was just a little bit too much. Um, I do sometimes find other authors do that, but. I do like history a lot, so when it's well done, I'm glad. Sometimes when it's a little bit obvious, I think uh, they might have just trimmed that. But uh, mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you yeah, have anything For me, to it's about discipline, I think, and I'm really bad at it, but I'm um, learning. I, I think that um, what I try to tell myself is, you know, there's a point where you're just going to have to stop. You have to stop doing this, because I do recognize it as a procrastination technique. Sometimes, I don't know if Christine feels the same way, but often when you sit down to write, it's, it's quite, it's like, I think one famous writer once said, it's like opening a really heavy door. It's a big door. You have to kind of 
get in the right space to create, and often it's easier to actually research. <laughs> so you think, oh, well, maybe I haven't quite researched that enough, and I need to find out a little bit more, so I'm going to do a bit more research today. So it's sort of being self-aware enough to go, no, you're just being really naughty. Stop that and start writing. And then also stopping the temptation, and I haven't done this yet, but I am thinking about maybe trying to go somewhere to write where I don't have the internet so that I can't fact check while I'm writing. Because mm. oh, yes. so, it's so oh, yes. horrible. It just you pulls write it you and out you come it. back because it'll take you. One thing I found, though, the start of the day of writing, if the mind is immediately quiet and settled before I start writing, I find that what helps get into that space is by reading something. You just take something, read a couple of paragraphs, and then, s because when you're actually reading, your mind goes someplace. To me, it feels like it goes deeper, and it's in that other visual world that's almost the space we dream in, and it's very personal, quiet, and our own very private space. And if l you're thinking of, you know, your shopping list and what needs to be done, and uh, this needs to be fixed in the house, that's not a good thing. So the reading gets you in that space. Yeah. Yeah, a mm. quick way to get into it. And then you have that quiet and you can start from there. It's, it's more easy to go from that to writing mm. than just to suddenly get there and say, ah, oh, suddenly I have to write. Mm. Mm. So, and, and I think there's different authors who some have a kind of quelling uh, yeah. prose and that's a good way to get you into that quiet space. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Get a bit more meditative. Yes. Yeah. 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 I right. wonder if I didn't do that with yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although yours kept me up at night. I did so it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's good too, though. <laughs> oh, there's one more burning, one more quick burning question over the other side from Ange. Yeah. Oops. For throwback. Yeah. Just a wee bit over time, so we'll just one more quick question. Yeah. Um, this is a question for Christine. Um, I just wondered. You talked about the research um, aspect and that when you were looking into, um, you know, you wanted to write the f historical fiction because there wasn't enough of that type of historical fiction. You know, there wasn't enough stories about the war and that aspect. It, so I'm getting a bit muddled here. Um, did you find when you were looking in your research, did you find anything like memoirs from German children, for example, or anything that, or was is all that being wiped or was it just really, really difficult? Um, no, I did, and I actually t talked to some people who were part of the Hitler Youth, and so grown men by then, grown elderly men, and it was extremely touching because they had everything that they had believed so um, so adamantly, as, you, as teenagers do when they believe something very strongly. Teenagers are like that, but they were given such an important cause and a mission like that and then because they saw time changing and the world changing and how everything viewed, they're revisiting that as older men, but seeing that they were just children at the time and they were also in part victims. Um, not in the same way as the people um, who were taken into concentration camps, but they were victims to take children and to teach something you know, that was absolutely untrue and to change who they would have been. Um, and that was why I start the novel with uh, uh, Johannes Jojo, who's just uh, riding his bike and he's just like any other child. And then I show the change as it starts to come, you know, step by step, how they work that into the, into the life. So these memories were, um, were really vital to me. The, the camp too, like any camp, that's incredibly fun for young men to go on camp. So it's a kind of mixed feelings for them afterwards because they had souvenirs, they had friendship, they were doing things, you know, sleeping overnight, sleeping under the stars, hunting, fishing. So on the one side, they had this, you know, great souvenirs, and at the other side, they understand looking back that they were actually being prepared to have a soldier life to fight something that they had been lied to because a lot of what they were told was absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, what we would call today fake news. You know, they were in no kind of essential danger. There were no people coming that were going to take them over. No one was looking to steal their blood. Um, you know, to tell them that the Jewish people were looking to steal their blood is such a perverse uh, kind of lie because the Jewish people kept to their own community. And in fact, if uh, someone Jewish wanted to marry someone who was non-Jewish, the family would have been very hurt. 
So to tell that kind of lie that they were looking to you know, be with people who were non-Jewish, it, it's just not true. So they realize all these lies that they were fed and that kind of changes the camp. You almost would think how they would feel. You know, my sons, they went to um, camp with their college, Nelson College, they all go and they had wonderful times. And I think to myself, imagine afterwards if that, that had all been part of a greater plan you know, on the one side, they had their wonderful souvenirs, and on the other hand, it was all part of a bigger picture that actually after left them very shaken as they became old enough to realize it. Mm -hmm. So I saw older men, you know, in their 80s just crying. It was very, very painful, you know, as they, they realized it, and they looked with a lot of regret. But as they said to me, how could they have known? They were taught that in school. They were taught that in camp. People trust what their teachers tell them. Um, yeah, and hopefully by li you listening to them and the story being told, they found some more compassion and yes. forgiveness for themselves. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. We've run out of time. It's been absolutely wonderful talking with you both. Um, thanks to Paige and Blackmore, who are supporting the festival by having an official bookstore where you can buy copies of these two it's important, fan fascinating and page-turning books. <laughs> so the, and Christine and Alexandra will both be available out in the foyer at the signing table so you can get your copies signed or you can have a chat and say hello to them and maybe ask them questions that aren't going to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so could you please join me in thanking Christine and Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you.